So what I would talk to you about today, I think, is a bit about uh, what's going on in my group and the Utah Genome Project, talk about some algorithms uh, that we've developed, uh, and give you also both an overview of how these things are being applied um, in the hospitals uh, for diagnosis, and also go into one algorithm I decided in some detail uh, because it's very much a part of this new generation of algorithmics called big data when people talk about artificial intelligence or automated reasoning and I thought it might be fun to see an example a bit about how something like that might work um, algorithmically. Um, so what is the Utah Genome Project? Uh, it is a local, state, and federally funded project. Its goal is to produce a campus-wide resource uh, for genomics and ge clinical uh, genetics, and it's got state, national, and international funding. And what I do is basically run the technical end of the project, in other words, uh, the software and algorithmics and the analysis pipeline. Um, and so when we were setting up the Utah Genome Project, there were sort of two domains of application we had to think about. One is what we call pediatric emergency room diagnosis. Child's born in the hospital, they are very ill. The attending physicians believe it's likely to be in genetic, genetic in cause. Can we um, sequence that child and determine the nature and underlying cause of the illness? And two, um, to empower um, research in family-based medicine, specifically taking advantage of a wonderful resource here, the Utah Population Database, which gives uh, about 150 years of history for literally millions of people, their families and relatives. Now. The easiest way to understand how a modern um, genome analysis pipeline aimed at clinical diagnosis would operate um, is to think about how uh, DNA sequencing has changed the informatics world. And for anyone involved in programming, I'll tell you, if you're getting into this, the number one way that genome sequencing has changed the informatics world is the size of the files you're trying to parse. Uh, are no longer in the realm of uh, a few thousand lines. They're often in the realm of excess of 50 to 100 million lines in the file. And so that has sort of been a phase transition uh, in heavy duty informatics and what people can tackle. Languages like Perl and Python can't really operate on data of that size. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use those languages for analysis, in fact, uh, most of the code I'm going to show you today is either actually written in Perl or was originally written in Perl and has since then been re-architected in C for reasons of speed. Um, but what it does mean is often as a programmer you are using um, some pre-parsing of the data in um, some sort of C um, code which is then giving you a higher dimensional or an overview out uh, look of the contents of a, what's a very, very large file. And then you're post-processing that and post-processing that in a scripting language like Perl or Python. Okay, so um, a bit of more about this pipeline and how it works. And like I said, the <coughs> easiest way to understand how a pipeline like this works is think about it in terms of history. And as many of you may know, we're now sort of leaving the age of GWAS or genome-wide association. And for about the past 15 years, the basic, really more than that, 20 years, the basic mode of analysis for understanding and discovering uh, disease-causing alleles and disease genes has been um, genome-wide association. And these experiments <coughs> typically per, um, proceed as follows. You collect a lot of case individuals, say 10,000 individuals that have type 2 diabetes, and you get a matched set of controls, say 10,000 age and gender matched individuals that do not have type 2 diabetes. Then what you do is you take blood or sputum from each of those individuals, you then genotype every individual in your case control data set using a microarray um, technology, where you're going to look at marker SNPs, say every 100 to 500 KB along the genome. Um, and then if the simplest case scenario if all goes exceedingly well. When you do that, what you're going to find is some variant that I've denoted by the red asterisk here and some gene that I've denoted by the green box here that all of your cases just about have, say, a T rather than an A at that position in that gene. And if that change is very rare in the controls. All right. Now, the problem with GWAS, one of the first problems, is that you can't assay every possible variant in the genome. You can only look at the variants that are actually on the chips. 
And so the approach that was taken for that was to identify a subset of frequently occurring variants in the human <laughs> genome that are associated with haplotypes. In other words, they show significant linkage disequilibrium with surrounding variants, such that if even the actual disease-causing variant was not on your microarray chip, it would be in significant linkage disequilibrium with some nearby marker SNP, and thus you'd still be able to see some sort of association. And so once you've done this, you go through the genome and you produce what's called a Manhattan plot. And the Manhattan plot is a very basic uh, way to display any sort of genomics data, where we're going to lay out the position in the genome, lay the chromosomes end to end, um, and every variant in the genome that was on our microarray, we're going to color as a dot, and we're going to calculate some kind of association statistic that measures how overrepresented that variant is in the cases versus controls, or how likely we would expect that to be under a null model. And if all goes well, we'll see these nice little peaks which are base pair changes that are associated with the disease. Now over time, um, sort of the uh, romance of GWAS began to wear off and there began to be more and more criticism over this issue what was called the missing heritability. And by missing heritability I mean this, is that when we go back and we look at the GWAS experiment, there is a strong association associating a particular variant, say in a particular disease, a uh, particular gene with a disease like type 2 diabetes. In other words, the odds that you would see that variant so much more frequently present in your cases versus controls, the probability of that might be near zero, typically 10 to the minus 10th, 10 to the minus 50th, etc. But the odds ratio, or how much of the illness that base change can explain in the disease in the population, is typically quite small. And so what GWAS increasingly was coming up with were variants that were powerfully and significantly associated with the disease, but if you carry that variant, your odds of getting the disease are only slightly worse than someone who doesn't. In other words, say one in 5,000 people uh, develops disease X, if you have that variant, your odds of getting that disease are like one in 4,500, 4, okay? Um, and so that problem was called the missing heritability, and there was a lot of debate about where the missing heritability might be, and there's no one place where it is, but a lot of it is um, due to what's called allelic heterogeneity. And this is an example here that illustrating this. Rather than one variant being overrepresented in your cases versus controls, if you could go through and sequence everyone, what you would discover was that there was no one variant that was overrepresented. The common theme was the same gene was being hit with damaging variants again and again in every individual in your cases versus controls, but few individuals share the same allele, okay? Because they're rare alleles that are happening spontaneously, they're bouncing around in the population, making people sick for a few hundred years, and then they're disappearing. And the problem is, is that these rare alleles are, were not on the chips, and it turns out that rare alleles, for some basic population genetic reasons, are never in linkage disequilibrium with uh, marker SNPs. And as a result, these variants were effectively invisible for any kind of GWAS-based association testing. All right? And so that was a big reason for the missing heritability. Now, um, about the time this was all being noticed, a new kind of statistical test began to crop up called a burden test. Um, and a burden <coughs> test works a lot like you would think it would be, do. Um, but it does is rather than trying to identify one variant that's overrepresented in cases versus <coughs> controls, what it does is it goes across the genome and it tries to calculate the relative burden difference in cases versus controls at each locus. Burden meaning basically the number and intensity of damaging alleles found in that locus in the cases versus the controls. And these burden tests have a couple of very nice features that really overcome the shortcomings of GWAS. First off, there's no longer any requirement that the variant be um, um, shared between the, case, between the case individuals. Secondly, it rescues um, the, the uh, association test from what's called the Bonferroni correction. And so when you do a statistical test, you have to adjust the probability for the observation 
by the number of tests you've done. Okay, so that basic adjustment that the most common one supplied is known as the Bonferroni correction. And so what you do is you say, well, all right, I've associated this SNP with this disease. And the odds of that SNP being that overrepresented um, in the cases versus controls by accident are, say, one in a million. But if I look at a hundred different SNP, a million different SNPs across the genome and try and associate each of them, the expectation is, is that I will find at least one variant by random chance with a probability of association of one in a million. And that's called the Bonferroni correction. And what you basically do is you take your p-value and you multiply by the number of tests you've done. All right? Um, it's a little different from that, but that gives you the flavor of it. And so these Ferdin tests have a very nice feature that as you increase the number of variants, in your sample that you're going to look at, the Bonferroni correction is a constant. It's the number of genes. And so what was going on in GWAS is, is as individuals, the, the study groups began to look at more and more variants, they had to recruit more and more cases and controls on the order of 10 and 100,000 individuals often to maintain statistical power when finding this Bonferroni correction. If we go to sequencing whole genomes, we would have to Bonferroni correct for in principle as million is three billion different variants in each test. And even if we recruited everyone on the planet, we still wouldn't have power to statistically associate a variant with a disease. Whereas once we group things and do burden on individual loci, we've got our power because our correction is always constant. So our response here at Utah to these problems and the attempt to create a burden test um, statistical um, machine to do this kind of test on genome sequences is a tool called VAST. And VAST was one of the first published um, burden tests and its use space has grown a lot over the years. And so when we originally pitched this project to the NIH, we called it VAST for a reason. So how many people here have done a BLAST search before? Yeah? So if you haven't done a BLAST search and you're thinking about pursuing um, some kind of career in programming, you need to find out about BLAST because it's the basic algorithm that basically kicked off the whole bioinformatics revolution. And what it does is it basically takes a query sequence and says search as a database for similar sequences. It's sort of like Google uh, for sequence. So we called BLAST um, Fast, fast, because it arrived with BLAST. And the idea was to produce a tool that had the same use, wide applicability and ease of use that BLAST does. Where you can think about your case genomes as being like a query, your control genomes as being the database you're going to search, you're going to get hits back, those are going to be genes in both cases, and you're going to have some sort of p-value or expect on those hits uh, to tell you how significant they are. And both tools are going to be fast. Now this is a Manhattan plot for a vast output. Um, and so it looks superficially a lot like the Manhattan plots I showed you for a GWAS experiment, where our chromosomes are shown along here on the X. Our association statistic is shown on the Y. In this case, it's the log minus log 10 p-value of the vast p-value. And so the higher up a dot is, the more likely it is to be causative. The difference between this Manhattan plot and the ones I showed you earlier in the GWAS examples is that the dots are no longer individual variants, they are genes. Each dot is a gene. There are actually 26,000 dots in this plot. Um, you can't see them all because many of them are down here on the axis. And so the height up on the y-axis is proportional to that gene's burden. And what this is, is this is actually a single child uh, with a uh, disease called Tay-Sachs, um, sequenced here, um, also the two parents. And the gene here you can see that has the most burden is a gene called Hex-A. This is the classic locus that causes Tay-Sachs. And indeed, this child's homozygous for an allele called the Ashkenaz Tay-Sachs founder allele. A very simple diagnosis and illustration of how uh, vast would work. <laughs> now, um, the project got off to a really uh, rapid start um, and jump start, if you will, uh, with this child here and this family here. This child was presented in Grand Rounds uh, in uh, 2010 here in the hospital. He was born um, with a 
rather striking phenotype, you'll notice that he looks elderly right at birth. That's progenaria. It's some other morphological abnormalities and cardiac problems and succumbed to a heart attack after about six months of life. It turned out upon review in the hospital and looking at the population database here that this child, which is shown here, belonged to a wider family that had been bringing in little boys over the last 30 years, all of which had had a very similar phenotype and all of which had died. Um, and so my colleagues, Golson Line and Alan Rote, were able to obtain um, blood and sequence the boy, his mother, and grandmother. And they came by the lab right as we were about three quarters of the way finished with the VAST project and asked if we could run it. And to make a long story short, about 20 minutes later, we had a hit on the X chromosome. And this was a real boon for Utah because it was the first example with um, whole exome sequencing of not just discovery of the cause of a known genetic disease, but we discovered a new genetic disease at the same time. And this disease is now known as Ogden syndrome in honor of the family uh, who's from Ogden. And there are several families, a handful now, around the country with this rare genetic disease. Now, in the course of this analysis, the thing that really struck me was that, okay, so we were able to identify the cause of this child's illness, but really we had all of this information coming out of the population database, going back all the way, um, in fact, this family goes all the way back into the early 19th century here in Utah and Idaho. Um, and if we could somehow compute over all of this information and the relatedness in the individuals, we would have still more power. And so this obviously is pretty congruent with the second goal of the Utah Genome Project, which is um, to try and use uh, families to enable uh, precision in family-based medicine and also general research. And so this goal led to an extension of VAS known as Pedigree VAS that we published in 2014. And the goal being basically simple. Can we compute over an individual's genome in the context of their family history and sequenced individuals in that family. Let me show you an example here. This is a family that we sequenced um, for the development of uh, pedigree VAS. This is a collaboration with the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, where they had previously determined in this family here by conventional means that there was a dominant GATA4 allele segregating through this family, causing cardiac septal defects. And so what we did is we went back took the blood from every individual in the family, um, you see underscore here, and did whole exome sequencing on each of them, both affected and unaffected. <coughs> now, this is what the vast Manhattan plot looks like when we take all the affected individuals and we run them through VAST and we try and associate a gene. And you'll notice it looks very different from the simple Tay-Sachs child I showed you a few minutes ago. And it doesn't look different in a good way. What you see is all the genes are massively inflated uh, with respect to their p-value. And although GATA4 is up here at the very top, there are many other genes up here as well. And the reason for that is vast as it was originally created was a case control tool uh, for use in those GWAS style analysis I showed you at the beginning. There's no way to compute over the expectation for allele sharing that you see in related individuals. And so that's what PVAS does. This is a Manhattan plot running pedigree VAS or PVAS where we're taking the sequenced exome of every individual in that family, both affected and undefected, and we're now computing a probability of association for each gene in the genome under a model whereby we're not only computing burden, but we're also taking into account what are the odds that this allele would be shared amongst that many individuals given their actual relationships to one another. And you can see we easily resolve GATA4 and we even pick up another modifier locus that we think came in through marriage. Okay? People following me so far? Okay, so switching from that, what I want to talk to you a bit about now in more detail is talk about this problem of pediatric emergency room style diagnosis. And everything I've showed you so far probably makes it look like this exome and genome sequencing together with something like VAST is basically undefeatable. Uh, unfortunately, that's never the case, and the biology um, always seems to throw a monkey wrench somehow into the computer science. Now, 
This is what a Manhattan plot looks like for a single with vast for a single um, person. All right, and you'll notice it looks different from those Manhattan plots I showed you before. Namely, there's this huge scatter and there's no resolution in the ranks for the genes. And the reason for that is, is that if you have the sequence of only a single individual, all right, outside of their family context or any other individuals that have the same disease, um, there's very little power in an individual genome to associate a gene or, or a variant with a particular disease. And that's not a shortcoming of the tool, that's just the nature of the human genome and the human population. And so one way we can try and overcome this problem is to try and combine phenotype information in with the genome sequence data um, in order to get us uh, better power. And we created a tool called Fever um, to do this. And I thought I would spend a little bit more time with this tool because it's a good illustration. You hear so much in the media about things like Watson and uh, uh, big data and how machines are going to reason and take over the world and everything like that. Uh, Fever is a tool that belongs to that domain. And it's pretty fun to see how these kinds of algorithms work, I think. Okay, so. First off, how does fever work? But more importantly, before we get going, what is it that fever does? And so fever solves a very simple problem. You take a vast report or any other tool you want that tries to prioritize genes and alleles associated with disease, and you feed fever together with that report a machine-readable phenotype description, candidate gene list, or medical record, etc. And fever is going to try and combine that information to compute over a joint posterior probability that a gene or allele is associated with disease. And that's a mouthful of description. Let me see if I can explain um, how this works, okay? So fever combines biomedical ontologies um, for accurate disease identification, even for single um, genomes. How many people in the room know what a biomedical ontology is? All right. Fair number of people. Um, let's go through those that in a bit more detail. Um, so, um, fever is it uses a variety of different biomedical ontologies. Probably some of these you've heard about. The two principal ones I'll tell you about today are the gene ontology and the human phenotype ontology. All of these are very widely distributed uh, biomedical tools. Although what fever is going to do with them is somewhat different from their original design and imagined applications. So um, what exactly is an ontology? Um, that's sort of a crazy question to try to ask, and depending on who you ask, you're going to get very different answers. But for practical bioinformatics applications, um, an ontology is something like this, where we have um, a series of nodes or concepts that are related to each other through a, what's called a relation. And so for example, we might have a line in a biomedical ontology that says deaminase activity is a catalytic activity, and that provides a definition. Um, hopefully most of you know that deaminase is activity is a catalytic activity. If you didn't know that, you know it now. Um, not only that, these very concise representations are what we call machine readable, and they can be computed over. So um, ontology, biomedical ontologies are generally organized such that our concepts are called nodes, our relationships are called edges, and so and we have our concepts as the names of the nodes, and then we have our class, our type of relationship between them uh, defined as well. And so what people have done in the genetics and genomics domain, oh, I should tell you that often people will talk about, you know, this is the child, that's the parent, etc. Okay, and so what you can have is multiple children for a given concept. So we can have a biomedical ontology that says uh, catalytic activity has two children, uh, deaminase activity and demethylase activity, both of which are or is a catalytic activities, etc. And what people often do is they associate genes with different concepts or nodes in these ontologies. So let's say someone's gone through in Go and annotated two genes that encode demethylases um, and associated with them with this concept here, two other genes, uh, deaminase activity, and associated them with that node there. 
What these things allow you to do, and what they were originally designed to do, was create data marts and what are known as knowledge bases, where now you can simply query um, your database, if you're using one of these ontologies to structure your data, and you can write SQL statements. How many people in here know SQL yet? Yeah? All right. So, like things, for example, give me all genes that have catalytic activity, but not just de um, but not deaminase activity. And you can easily recover then all the demethylases, for example, right? And so these kinds of queries that these tools were originally um, designed um, and, and they're very effective at and they're widely used. Now, these ontologies are generally represented as we go to scale by what are called directed acyclic graphs, okay? So for example, you have some root concept here. You have all your different child concepts here. As you go down the tree, they become more specific. And as I said, in the genetics and genomics domain, people have associated particular genes with the different nodes in the ontology. And they get fairly big. Uh, Go, for example, has about 41,000 nodes in this last re release with about uh, 26,000 genes, basically all, most human protein coding genes annotated to it. Now, I think you can probably see how we might be able to use and repurpose one of these biomedical ontologies um, to help with our disease gene identification. So let's say that we're looking at here a biomedical ontology called the human phenotype ontology, in which the nodes or concepts here are associated with particular human phenotypes. So these are some examples here. Let's say we have a patient whose phenotype is, as described by the human phenotype ontology, is cardiomyopathy, ventricular septal defect, and arrhythmia. These are the actual node IDs here. And let's say we represent those three nodes in our, our directive, um, in our ontology uh, by coloring them red uh, right here. Now obviously, if someone has previously associated genes to those three nodes, those are logically good candidate genes to start looking for a deleterious <laughs> mutation in. Um, and so that would be one way, simple way right there, to generate a good usual suspects list. But what fever does is it does one better. It's going to start out with those three nodes. I'm sorry, it looks like the red or green on this light on this projector is a bit off. Um, and start out labeling, and then it's going to do something called propagation, or what's called in the machine learning field message passaging, where it's going to basically take, put a one on each of our starting nodes, and every time we cross an edge, divide by two such that as we move away from our start, things cool off, those numbers approach zero, saying a gene associated with one of those distant nodes is not as good a candidate. But we also observe some really interesting behaviors where we'll see cases of different lines of propagation converge to often heat up a concept or node far from our original um, starting nodes. Um, and giving us some new, very hot candidates where we wouldn't have previously had any. Can I ask you a quick question? Uh huh. So, just to make sure I understand, so there's a, a clinical phenotype um, that somebody's figured out a way to identify. Right, so this would be like the physician's description uh -huh. um, describing, say, a child, okay. right? Um, they have cardiomyopathy, ventricular septal defect, and arrhythmia. Those terms are part of this controlled vocabulary in the human phenotype ontology. Those are their node IDs there, and they correspond to three different nodes in this graph. Does that make and sense? And how did you get from the clinical phenotype to those three nodes? How did you know it to those three nodes? How do we know that cardiomyopathy had that ID right there? Yeah, so you can go, there's a variety of tools online. If you Google HPO, or also a tool called Phenotips, mm -hmm. You can basically type in the common medical terminologies to describe an illness or a symptom or a phenotype, and it will navigate down through the graph and give you nodes that are, you know, pretty good linguistic matches um, to the term you've typed in. And then basically you choose those, and through that process you describe the patient using the using the human phenotype ontology. Is that yeah? Okay, so the next step, 
is now that we've done this propagation um, across the human phenotype ontology, we can again take advantage of these gene annotations to connect up other biomedical ontologies. For example, the gene ontology has no phenotype information in it. It only describes attributes of genes, for example, deaminase activity, um, potassium transporter, et cetera, and sometimes their roles in uh, development, like mesoserve specification or something like that. But what we often find is happen, some gene that's been annotated to a concept in the HPO will also be in Go. And so we can start with the HPO, if we like, we can propagate across it, and then we can follow these edges into the gene ontology and continue the process down there and even on to other ontologies. And at the end, what we get is what we call an equilibrated super network, where we have a number between one and zero on each of the nodes in all of these different biomedical ontologies that then we can associate with each chain. Now, um, this is a simple way that Fever deals with the score. Um, it uses these node values after some renormalization as what's called a naive um, Bayesian implementation to be a prior probability for the vast forward probability. So we're going to modulate each of our vast gene association burden test probabilities by um, the, the hot, hotness, if you will, of the nodes in that, uh, those biomedical ontologies. And I'll show you some real life examples in, except in a moment that will give you some more intuition. Um, and so what I'm going to do now um, is show you three actual examples to show you how all this comes together. Um, the first um, simple case, a uh, child with very severe liver disease. Now this is a child um, basically uh, originally diagnosed a patient of my colleague Steve Guthrie. And we took this child, um, originally he had a phenotype. Uh, Dr. Guthrie thought he knew um, what was likely to be the cause of this child's illness. We had traditional genetic tests run on the child, came back negative for that disease, so we thought we would sequence and have a look. So this is the child's exome, and you can see there's not really um, any likely candidate just by running VAST, and that's because all we have here is a single exome. This is what happens when we take that same VAST report and we pass it to fever together with this single phenotype description for this child here, intrahepatic coleostasis, which describes the actual problem with their liver. And you can see it's a world of difference. So here we have basically no hot candidates. Now when we combine in that phenotype data, we get one very well uh, resolved candidate. More importantly, there's no filtering here. What happens is each gene's priority is toggled as a function of its original vast p-value and that prior probability coming out of the biomedical ontologies to give us our best candidate. Now that gene is ABCD11, and it turns out this is, was an interesting case uh, for a variety of reasons. So the child's phenotype was very similar to progressive familial interhepatic coleostasis. In fact, Steve Guthrie refused to believe he didn't. Uh, have this disease, yet the typical genetic test said the child didn't have the disease. Now VAST identified two damaging alleles in this gene, and ABCD11 uh, mutations are the standard cause of this genetic disease. Now these two mutations here form what's called a compound heterozygote. Now how many people know what that word means? Yeah. Okay, so a compound heterozygote is this, is that normally we think of diseases as being dominant or recessive. Dominant if one mutation is sufficient to cause the disease. Recessive if it takes two copies of the mutation to cause the disease. A compound heterozygote is a case where someone has the disease because the chromosome that came from the mother at that locus carries a damaging allele. The mother was healthy because she had one normal copy. The father also was healthy. He had a damaging mutation in the same gene, but at a different position. The child gets doubly unlucky. They have one mutation damaging inherited from the mother, the different mutation inherited from the father, so both copies of the gene are inactivated, and that's called a compound heterozygote. And so um, the maternal variant was actually a known allele in the population that causes this disease. 
But the father's allele was completely novel. And because of that, the child failed the diagnostic test because there was no prior evidence by the typical diagnostic testing to say that that change uh, was likely to cause the disease, although Vass said it did. All right, let's look at a slightly more complicated case now. This is a collaboration with Karen Chin. Um, and uh, this is a family in her practice with what's called common variable immune disease. These are individuals that are prone to recurrent infections. Um, common variable immune disease is sort of a catch-all term, um, but the general trend is that you have trouble mounting and sustaining an immune response to an infection, and so you have recurrent um, infectious disease-based illnesses. Now, um, Karen identified um, one family here, a mother and two children, uh, with CBID, and these are the HPO phenotype descriptions for these three individuals. Recurrent infections, abnormality of humoral immunity, and another individual that had similar um, spectrum of diseases from an unrelated family here. Now this is a PVAS run, and you'll notice superficially there doesn't seem to be much information in this family. We have two candidates that are actually tied as the two best candidates, but there's very little resolution in the ranks um, in this run. Now, when we pass that vast PVAST report to fever, together with the phenotype information, you can see one of those candidates disappears, the other becomes a very strong candidate, and is well resolved uh, from any other genes in the genome. So that gene is NF-kappa B2. Um, and this turned out to be a very interesting case. So first off a bit about the nature of the mutations that drive that association in vast and fever. The family A has a one base pair deletion that causes a stop at amino acid codon 861. Um, the unrelated individual from family B has a single nucleotide change that causes a stop at a very similar place in the protein, very consistent with their very similar phenotypes. Now, a lot of follow-up functional analysis established that it is um, loss of NF-kappa uh, B2 activity that causes the CBID in these individuals, but the neat thing about this from an informatics perspective is that this gene had never before been associated with common variable immune disease. In fact, NF-kappa B2 had never before been associated with the disease at all. And yet, what you see is somehow in the combined knowledge coming out of the human phenotype ontology plus the gene ontology, there was somehow latent information um, that said that that gene was actually um, a good candidate to cause that disease. And so, there's, this is what people get so excited about, about these big data or these uh, artificial and reasoning style applications, is their ability to do that. A human being, even though human beings made those ontologies and made those annotations, can't deal with data at that scale to under, uncover those latent trends. It's just not, our minds you know, can't wrap our heads around that much information. But these kinds of algorithmic approaches can, and they can do so very effectively, going from something like this to something like that, even though there's no, never been a published paper or anything to say that that gene might be associated with human disease. Okay, and so for the last example here, I thought I would uh, sum up with sort of um, get, trying to give you an idea of what's coming in the future in the clinical and medical domain um, by looking at a family um, with cardiovascular disease. And this family is a little different from the ones we've looked at before. First off, with respect to scale. So this is a family I've been working on in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Marty Tristani, in pediatric cardiology. And so these individuals colored in red here are individuals with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is basically heart palpitations. It's the classic problem that, you know, an elderly person would say, you know, I'm having heart arrhythmias or palpitations, someone in their 70s, 80s, that kind of thing. About half or three quarters of the individuals in this room are going to develop that uh, atrial fibrillation in their late 70s. But in these individuals, typically the onset is earlier than 40 years, 95% penetrance by age 40. And by the time you're a teenager, about 50% of the affected individuals in this family 
um, have the disease. And so it's a significant problem because atrial fibrillation, basically, if you have it long enough, will cause you to have a stroke. And so if you develop atrial fibrillation as a teenager, you are at a very high risk for stroke by the time you're in your 40s or 50s. That's a medical certainty. Now, this family is a very interesting one. Originally, um, Marty saw these three individuals in the clinic uh, with early onset atrial fibrillation. And these individuals over here, and he thought they were separate families. Um, we did follow-up analysis with the population database, and it turns out that um, both ends of this giant family are related to one another from a single founder couple that died in Pennsylvania in the early 19th century. And in fact, there are thousands of individuals in this extended clan in Utah and Idaho, um, all descended from these founder individuals. And so most of these individuals are in the population database. This is a very collapsed tree. There's almost 2,000 individuals in just this little piece over here. This family, for example, does not actually know they are related to this family. Okay, but we do through the population database. And so these very large families like this are, are interesting. So first off, they are absolute shooting fish in a barrel for disease gene discovery. So what this is, is that this is all of those sequenced individuals out of that extended pedigree run through PVACs. And you can see we've got this one dot here, and then that's our best hit, and then this comet trail down beneath it. Now, anybody want to guess why there's that comet trail of associated genes beneath the best candidate? Those are the neighboring genes on the chromosome, and so what you're seeing segregating through this big network is a single disease causing allele, it's causing disease if you inherit it, it because it's in a given gene. But then on average, as that gene moves through that extended clan, it's going to carry with it rare variants in the surrounding genes around it, which gradually will fall away at larger um, relationship, more distant relationships, but they'll still come through. So there's that gene right there. So what happens if we pass this um, to fever together with a simple phenotype description, atrial fibrillation? You can see that comet trail largely disappears, and we're left with one monster candidate there. Now, this case is sort of, in many ways, the opposite of the common variable immune disease situation. This mutation, it turns out, is in a gene called KCNQ1 which is the go-to gene for someone with a possible genetic cause of atrial fibrillation. So there's nothing novel about that discovery. Interestingly enough, um, some other families in Kentucky were recently identified with this same allele, and we wonder if they aren't actually related where, um, you know, some people stopped as they came to Utah and places like Kentucky, et cetera, others moved on. Uh, but the interesting thing about this has to do with the increased goal for precision medicine at the university and at other medical institutions around the country. So what we have here in Utah alone um, is about um, 2,000 individuals, all descended from these individuals that are in our health records here. We can know for every one of these individuals, if we sequence them or even do a simple PCR test for that allele, whether or not they have that allele. And so what we have now is, in principle, the means to really engage, begin to engage in precision medicine activities, which is a word you hear a lot about. But what does this really mean? Well, for precision medicine in the genetics domain, it would mean going out, contacting all of these related individuals from the Utah population database, bringing them in, testing them for the allele, and then knowing in that family for every parent whether or not they were at risk for having a child with that allele, and for every child born into that family, thousands of individuals, we would know at birth whether or not that child was going to develop atrial fibrillation. And so you could begin to give the right medical, preemptive medical care, basically even before birth. Now, atrial fibrillation is one case. We have some other interesting cases with my colleague Josh Schiffman in the HCI. He works on genetics of um, pediatric cancers, 
where they've been bringing in large families like this that are known to be segregating um, a dominant allele that causes glioblastoma, very lethal form of brain disease, bringing in the families, genotyping the kids, putting them through an MRI. And the last round, for example, they found six children, I believe they were all under the age of five, that carry the allele that already have nascent brain tumors that are completely asymptomatic. So you would never actually know these children um, had a tumor still for years, all right? But now, because you know they have the allele, you know what family they're in, you can go out, contact them, bring them in, test them, and monitor them, and give them chemo at a much earlier stage than they would never normally get it, with the idea that that will lead to, to increase, increased survivorship. So about one in 40 individuals in the population has a rare allele that predisposes them to significant lifetime risk for disease. Uh, for example, one in 25 Caucasians carries an allele in cystic fibrosis, saying that um, if you carry that allele, the odds are one in 25 that you're gonna have a child with cystic fibrosis. Uh, one in 100 individuals carries a BRCA allele, uh, predisposing you for breast cancer. There are many others as well, such that, that adds up to one in 30 to 40 individuals is going to develop over the course of their life a significant life-threatening illness that basically if we know your genome, we can know from birth that that's gonna to happen to you and try and get the right medical care from birth going forward. And that's really gonna change how medicine is done worldwide. And that's what's driving the precision medicine efforts here in Utah, nationwide, and then also specifically um, Genomics England, where Great Britain has the advantage, well, I don't know if it's an advantage, some say it is, some say it isn't, uh, of having nationalized healthcare. Um, and so they are preparing basically to sequence every British subject um, to enable these kinds of precision medicine applications. And I think we're gonna see very similar trends um, and projects here in the US over the next couple years. Um, just briefly, um, to finish up here, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Utah Center for Genetic Discovery, um, some of my outside collaborators, especially the NIH and NSF for all of their wonderful funding they've been giving us, and finally the individuals in my lab, especially Barry Moore, my lab director, who um, makes and coordinates all of this wonderful science. Thank you very much. So, people, yeah. Um, that's really cool stuff. Um, so, if, if I understand this correctly, it's still associations right now, actual causation, not really. Yeah, and so that's a, you put your finger right on a, on a big issue is association as opposed to causation. And so, right now, the real question is what happens when you discover a new allele? You think it's responsible for the disease. How do you actually know? And generally, right now, what we try and do is we try for some kind of functional follow-up. For example, for the Ogden syndrome, uh, the kid here in Utah, the first one, that mutation is in an acetylase, acetyltransferase. And so we were able to do, there's a classic enzymatic assay for that and show that that allele basically destroys about 80% of the activity. Um, then we go out, we find other families that have the same phenotype, they have the same allele or a very similar allele in the gene, and you also see the same change, and that's taken as proof. Because uh, the other options, you're starting with you're starting with the clinical phenotype, right. finding the genetic component right. association. So now you just start with the genetic association in a really good group, and then find the clinical kind of phenotype associated. Right? Can you do that in reverse? And and absolutely. And more broadly in the question you ask, can you just confirm a, a, an allele through statistical power? And so right now, there aren't enough sequenced individuals to enable those kinds of activities. Uh, and so you have to right now go to some kind of follow-up uh, approach. Now the American Society, American Society for Medical Genetics, ACMG, I forget what the the, the acronyms for, has established some rules for reporting uh, variants of unknown significance uh, in, in different genes in the genome uh, to return those results to the idea for preemptive precision medicine, even though you don't know that they're necessarily causative 
So that's one sort of, you know, balanced approach. I think as we sequence more individuals, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of individuals over the next couple decades, uh, ideally we would have, you know, just amazing power and we'd be able to know through association. Uh, but, you know, data at that scale, there are other challenges that have to be faced, so we'll see if that pans out. But a lot of people, that's what a lot of people are thinking. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? Mark? Yeah. Um, so, two questions. One is kind of related to the Utah Population Database. So, you're talking about like, uh, you know, the UK is going to go out, they're going to you know, get samples on everyone. What's the prioritization with collecting samples for Utah Population Database? Is it all disease driven? I'm just kind of curious at how valuable older people, you know, I just think, you know, my parents are both born in Utah, so they'd be in it. They're in their 80s. You know, You'd be surprised who's in it. I'm in it. They, I mean, you know. Before they die. Yeah. But just kind of curious of how that's kind of prioritization is going on. The second thing is Karen kind of mentioned the way you got into this is that you learned how to do simple Unix scripting to start with. Kind of comment on. Yeah. Kind of like so I. Your so mutation. yeah. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, <laughs> although I, I often teach them, I've never actually had um, an upper division mathematics course or computer science class. Um, and so. I uh, basically learned how to program as a postdoc. I went in coming from a bench biologist, pipetting all day long, um, doing C. elegans research, uh, switched over, managed to land a postdoc at the Human Genome Project right as it was taken off, and got there and was rather surprised when it seemed to be, as far as I could tell, I'd been recruited for the following use, that physicists and computer scientists and engineers were gonna write out arithmics and then they were going to make me look at the outputs all day long and say, did this work, yes or no? Uh, because they had no idea, they couldn't tell if their own code was working or not. Um, and so it was pretty obvious to me that if I could learn how to do those things, you know, there would be definitely a career uh, available there. And so uh, at the time, uh, this was 1995, uh, so Perl 5 and Java had just appeared. Uh, and so I jumped in and taught myself Perl, also, you know, got help from my, my friends and other postdocs, one of which was Gabor Marth, we were postdocs together. He has a, a PhD um, in um, statistics and machine learning, uh, so, you know, he taught me a bit about programming, I taught him some biology, etc. I think. But, um, so that's how I started programming. I went from there, I landed a job at Solera uh, and ended up there uh, advancing through the ranks and became a, a group leader there in charge of all the genome analysis software. Um, and then my skills grew, you know, over time, a lot of late nights reading and uh, about programming. Uh, and then have moved around since and, and still I, I probably spend an hour a day writing code uh, to this day. Um, so it's, it's good work. And not only that, you know, there's the old saying, it's good work if you can find it. Uh, the great thing about programming is that uh, y it's easy to find. Uh, matter of fact, people will find you if you can write code. Uh, and salaries tend to be very high. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. You can move around. You can live more or less where you want. You can work remotely. Uh, and so it opens up a lot of doors and if you went into all of this with because of an interest in biology like I did, um, you can even really do biology in a way you never would have imagined uh, with a pipette man. Sometimes, how many people here have seen uh, the movie Aliens 2? <laughs> yeah? Okay, another question. I think if we were to do a Venn diagram on Blast, Aliens 2, and we'd have a funny set of overlaps there. Uh, but uh, at the end of Aliens 2, you know, where they're fighting with those power suits on, I sort of feel sometimes that like when you learn to code, that's sort of what your brain is like uh, once you're software enabled. Uh, basically, you can do things in the research domain that are simply impossible uh, no matter how many papers you read or how fast you pipette or, or what have you. And so it's, it's very empowering um, as a researcher. So there are a lot of ways and a lot of directions to go uh, in programming. Another thing I really like about it is it, it's not a zero-sum game. You don't have to be like, you know, it doesn't, how many people have seen Highlander? 
All right, so programming isn't like Highlander. Uh, there isn't one winner at the end. It's basically once you get even rudimentary skills, you begin to win. Uh, and so as you get more skills, you win more, uh, but you never, you never really lose because you can do some programming. And so, uh, you know, it's whatever's right for you, it's how far you go with it. Um, after a certain point with programming, there is this weird aspect to it that it's sort of like uh, playing a musical instrument. Some people have greater affinity, regardless of intelligence, uh, it seems, uh, with some of the more esoteric aspects of programming. But anybody that can get a PhD in the biological sciences uh, is capable of, of mastering all the fundamentals uh, for basically applied programming. Uh -huh. And we have the Utah Population Database, and I understand the Amish um, has a great database uh, also. Right. And Iceland. Are there others that we're trying to work with? Well, I think two things with that that are sort of interesting to think about. I mean, the population database here has grown. It's gigantic now. Uh, because everybody has basically worked so hard to include, you know, all of their relatives, whether or not they were historically members of the church or not. So it goes way beyond that. I think it's it's one of the largest ones. Ancestry.com is creating a very large commercial one. There are a variety of businesses, companies in Europe that are.